You may have heard of me. My name is Blake. It was a late 70s BBC science fiction series about rebels taking on an evil galactic empire. It was beloved and mocked in equal measure. This is the best robotic engineering I've ever seen. But it did prove that you could make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Kinda. Maybe if you squinted. We will do it here and we will do it now. All of us? Blake Seven. I think I can destroy it. Sometime in the far future, in the third century of the new calendar, a group of rebels with the most powerful space vessel in the galaxy take on the authoritarian regime of the Terran Federation. And look, it's really worth getting this out of the way up front. For the rebels, things don't go so well. Blake 7 was a BBC space opera television series that ran for 52 episodes broadcast between 1978 and 1981. It has a similar look to Doctor Who of the late 70s and the early 80s, which isn't too surprising when they were made with similar facilities, budgets, resources and the available technology of the day, plus a large number of behind the scenes personnel who'd worked on both shows. We've talked about it and discovered we care what happens to you. Within reason, of course. We're as surprised about it as you are. Not to mention embarrassed. The Federation rules most of the galaxy with an iron fist. Blake is a political prisoner who conveniently gets his hands on an abandoned alien space battlecruiser, the Liberator. Along with his crew, pilot Jenna, computer expert Avon, nerfed strongman Gan, cowardly thief Villa, and the telepathic alien Callie, the crew tried their darndest to bring the Federation down. Along the way, they were of course joined by Space Captain Tarrant, weapons designer Dana, and gunfighter Sulin. Of course, with the odds stacked against them, try as they might, the good guys don't always win. They come close at times, but yeah. So if you've not seen how Blake 7 ends, but you're interested in experiencing the show for yourself, here is the time to stop watching this and maybe watch one of our other videos. But please come back when you have watched Blake 7. It's the only way I can be sure that I was right. That you were right. Otherwise, keep watching. Blake 7 was made on a tight budget with even tighter time constraints, with the BBC's then standard system of a few days of location, filming, and a day or two in the multi-camera studio to record an entire episode. To say parts of it hold up well and other bits do not is fair. Everybody has good days and bad days, but then even St. Francis of Assisi had to throw his hands up in the air and admit rats could go and get fucked. This is interesting. Blake 7 debuted on BBC One in January of 1978, where it was a decent-sized success with viewers. The original idea was that the show would run for at least 26 episodes across two series, with series creator Terry Nation writing all of the first 13-episode run and five more for the second series. We'll loop back to the series' origins and its creator later in this video. Doesn't it bother you that you spend your life in a state of drug-induced tranquility? Blake Seven's introductory episode is totally unlike any other episode of the series. It's a political thrill that sets up life under the repressive Federation. Citizens living quietly in domed cities in a state of drug-induced tranquility, while even non-violent resistance is crushed ruthlessly. Rog Blake is a model citizen, who it turns out was once the leader of a major resistance group who'd been captured, brainwashed, had publicly denounced his ways and his followers, and then brainwashed again. Well, after all of this, he's captured and they try to brainwash him once more. It's like it says in the bottle of brainwash. Rinse and repeat, always repeat. One pleasant side effect of brainwashing is that it curls your hair much better than heated rollers. Blake is sentenced to spend the rest of his life on a Federation penal colony. Along the way, he makes some new friends. Jenna, Villa, Gan, Avon, and Nova, who's not actually given a name on screen for some odd reason. Before reaching their destination, Blake manages to commandeer an abandoned alien space vessel and comes into contact with its enigmatic main computer, Zen. And then he puts together a crew. With a ship like this and a full crew, then we can start fighting back. With the most advanced spaceship in the galaxy, newly rechristened as the Liberator, Blake and his six crewmates embark on a journey to bring down the Federation. For a series called Blake 7, you might be thinking the numbers don't add up. Well, there's also the ship's computer, Zen. Seven of us can run the ship properly. Six, surely. You forgot Zen. 
You're not counting that machine as a member of the crew. Say what you like, but the computers would always remain a part of the crew, even when technically there was a short period where there are actually eight of them. Blake 7 as a title really does roll off the tongue. I mean, Blake's 8 sounds like a dietary supplement, and you know, other numbers don't really work much better. Blake 6 sounds like a disease, and Blake's 9 makes you ask the question, Blake's 9 what? Including the computers and the number made sense. It is far cheaper and easier to write for fewer human characters. But it is a bit like going to the movies by yourself and having to buy two full-priced adult tickets. One for you and another for your mobile device. Hey, where is my popcorn? The navigation units will accept your spoken commands. Please state speed and course. Rog Blake is an idealistic hero, preferring to do the right thing over the most convenient. He's not always forthcoming with information, prone to springing dangerous missions on his crew with little consultation. He certainly relies on loyalty far more than his ability to form a consensus. That's why I misled you just a little. Blake's efforts to undermine the Federation would make him a legend throughout the galaxy, if not on his ship. If you turn this ship round, you will kill all of us. And while Blake initially dislikes the concept of his fame, it does rather go to his head in a major and quite tragic way. We've done it! We've done it! I've done it! Gareth Thomas's portrayal of Blake is different from the original conception. He's the boss, he's the hero, but he's also dangerous to be around since he can be blinded by his goal to destroy the Federation at any cost. Rog Blake. You may have heard of me, I have a ship called the Liberator. Gareth Thomas would leave Blake 7 after two seasons to avoid typecasting. But since the show named after his character was still running after his departure, it came to the same effect as far as being hired by directors who assumed he was still on the show. He'd make two further appearances in the series, but eventually insisted on Blake being killed off definitively. Yes, I worked on that project too. Small world. Large project. I didn't work on it. Jenna Stannis was a top pilot who was sent to a prison planet for smuggling offences. Jenna is Blake's loyalist supporter. Even when he takes the support of his crew for granted, Jenna can hold her own in a battle, whether it's against crazed assassins, bounty hunters or Federation troops. She can also shut down her belligerent crewmate Avon with a few words. Could you kill someone? Face to face, I mean. I don't know. Could you? There's one sure way of finding out. While there was never any overt hint of an attraction between Jenna and Blake, there was clearly something, judging by the slightly jealous looks other women flirting with Blake would receive. Sally Nevette does a good job of the glamorous space pilot who actually gets in on the action, at least in the first season. The second series saw Jenna and crewmate Callie confined to the Liberator to operate the teleport more and more, or to pop down with a spare teleport bracelet at the end for the lads. Nivette would be one of the first to indicate that she would leave the series after the second year. The Federation has beaten us all at least once. At least. Kurt Avon was a computer genius who tried to pull 500 million credits from the Federation banking system, but came a cropper. Avon has no interest in revolutions, he just wants to be free, and ideally he wants to be rich. A condition he calls freech. Avon, why do you keep everything to yourself? Why so secretive? Perhaps I'm shy. Avon is a bit of a tech bro. He's all about himself and his own well-being and his own money. If you ask to borrow Avon's car for an hour to pick up a table from Ikea, you'll likely end up with either a payment plan or a knife in the knee. If Avon invites you to brunch, bring your wallet, since you'll be picking up the check, because Avon somehow always manages to teleport just before the bill arrives. Avon is hard to get close to, aloof, and he's smarter than you. We know this because he's always bloody well telling us. Don't you ever get bored with being right? Just with the rest of you being wrong. Being a computer genius in Blake 7 means you never need to go near anything as prosaic as a keyboard, since all the high-tech computers in Blake 7 can be physically hot-wired. Avon and Blake have an adversarial relationship, with the former unable to hide his contempt for Blake most of the time. Staying with you requires a degree of stupidity of which I no longer feel capable. Now you're just being modest. The various pissing contests between Blake and Avon would usually see Blake win, if for no other reason than he was slightly taller, and it was his name on the tin. Despite this, Avon saves Blake's life several times. Eventually, Avon lets it be known that he's going along with Blake for one reason. <laughs> you want the Liberator? Exactly. Halfway through the show's run, there will be a major realignment of the series, and Avon would emerge as the group's undisputed leader. This is my ship. Paul Darrow played Avon in a very dramatic style, calculated to make you watch him whenever he was on screen. Just watch his hands. Good shot, Avon. 
I was aiming for his head. Sometimes he's overacting, sometimes he's underacting, at one point possibly sedated, but what we got was usually compelling to watch. I presume you have no tedious scruples about cheating and lying. None at all. Oh, good. Avon would spend three seasons trying to get away from Blake's crusades before eventually embracing the idea of defeating the Federation. Blake would have been proud of you, you know. I know, but then he never was very bright. He would also become quite the paranoid psychopath by the end of the series. Death is something that he and I face together on a number of occasions. I always thought that his death and mine might be linked in some way. Avon is often portrayed as a ruthless anti-hero, ready to kill at a moment's notice in order to save his own skin, even his own crewmates. But at least you and I can be certain that we can get away when we want to. But then that's what they said about Auntie Beryl after the incident on her yacht. Villa Restel is a talented thief, occasional magician and a locksmith who can open almost any door. There isn't a lock I can't open. If I'm scared enough. In fact, Villa's main story function most of the time is in opening doors. He's basically a key fob. I've got this problem with confined spaces. There's a medical name for it. Cowardice. In most episodes, he's also the comic relief, ready with a complaint. He's the first to break ranks and run and hide. He's a bit of a drunk and later on a lech. Well, she's pretty for one thing. I hadn't really noticed. We've seen you not really noticing frequently. There'd be a few episodes where Villa is front and centre and a couple of others where his instincts help save the day. Michael Keating would also be the only actor to appear in every episode of the series. I've been an admirer of yours for, um, well, for as long as I can remember. Well, maybe not that long. I mean, uh, you're not that old, are you? But uh, then again, you did start very young, didn't you? I think I feel sick. Callie is the alien of the crew. She begins the series as an outcast from her home world of Aron, an isolationist world whose inhabitants, or at least some of them, can communicate telepathically. Callie left her planet to become a freedom fighter on the planet Saurian Major, where she would later join up with Blake. Callie's initially not welcomed by the likes of Avon and Jenna. I'm locked up or dumped. You should have never brought her on the ship. But she would become a mainstay of the crew. Whenever they needed a bit of telepathy for story purposes or somebody to be taken over by an alien entity. He's an animal, Callie. Yes, and it's contagious, isn't it? Callie would eventually be neutered as a character, doing very little during the second season and would become a humanistic counterbalance to the likes of Avon and Tarrant in the third year. Well, how can you enjoy yourself staying here? Well, maybe it's got something to do with the fact that you won't be. Oh, thank you. Jan Chapel would leave the show after the end of the third year. May you die alone and silent. The original intention was for Callie to have black eyes, at least when using her powers, which at the time would have necessitated incredibly uncomfortable contact lenses. So actress Jan Chappell managed to dodge a bullet with that. I can attest to that, I once wore black contact lenses, mainly because it was a cheap way to black out the windows of my Range Rover. Blake, I shall count. When I reach the right number, call my name. Telepathy is a very useful thing to have when you're a fugitive. I mean, you can save an absolute fortune on burner phones and prepaid cards, but it also means you've made another enemy, phone companies. Family reunions may be quieter, but no less bitchy, since playing I Spy is frustrating and it's utterly impossible to properly plan a surprise party. Oleg Gan killed a guard who'd murdered his woman. He'd had a brain implant to limit any stress that could drive him to kill. Gan is not an accomplished technician, a pilot, a master strategist, and apart from some wrestling moves, is next to useless in a deadly fight. He does have a big heart and a strong moral compass. Boy, was he sentenced to the wrong prison planet. I killed a security guard. They said it was murder, and he had a gun. I was unarmed. He killed my woman. David Jackson does a good job with scripts that would often forget about Gan for the most part. A fight scene here, or him having to use his strength here and there. But such was the way the character was treated, half of his interactions seemed to be non-verbal. When it came to knock off a character for dramatic effect, Gan was the character who was eventually chosen. What are you worth dying for? He was the first to have an on-screen death, but thanks to lackluster direction, his selfless sacrifice has less emotional impact on viewers than knocking over a glass of water. Oh, Gan. Zen is the Liberator's main computer, controlling all of the vessel's many interlinked computer systems. Zen is a giant wall-sized Alexa, but he doesn't listen in on your arguments and order detergent for your washing machine. Wisdom must be gathered. It cannot be given. Don't philosophize at me, you electronic moron. Answer the question. 
Zen. Peter Tuttenham voiced the rather monotonous but reassuring Zen, a detached character with little personality. But curiously, he's not narrating ads selling life insurance. Can your family afford not to call our free hotline? Oops, spoke too soon. Of course, having established Blake and company as fugitives of the Federation, you need somebody to try to bring them to justice. Space Commander Travis is as hard-ass an officer as you'll ever see in Blake 7, dedicating his life to capturing or killing Blake. Goodbye, Blake. He also has a personal stake in that they met years previously where Blake caused Travis severe injuries that resulted in him losing an arm and left with a scarred face and only one good eye. Fire on my command. Aye, aye, Commander. <laughs> Travis has a weapon built into his artificial arm, a whacking great laser on destroyer, which is deadly, but it has drawbacks for the user in that sitting on your hands on a cold day is more painful than you'd think. Travis is determined to capture Blake. He's obsessed with getting revenge, obsessed with killing Blake, yada, yada, yada. I am your death, Blake. But as he is the show's antagonist, his posts on social media do become a bit one-noted. Travis would be eventually played by two actors. In the first series, we had Stephen Gripe, who made the black-hatted villain interesting to watch, though the actor himself found the part limiting and declined to return for the second series. The role was recast with Brian Croucher, who had the bad luck to play a role played to perfection by somebody else. Croucher also had the misfortune to lock horns with the director of many of the episodes featuring the character. I'm planning to leave. You're going to give me a pursuit ship. Oh, and the trigger circuit for this. Mm. You think so? Supreme Commander Servalan was originally intended to be a one-off character, just to show how Blake's early activities were being perceived within the Federation, and to assign Travis the task of dealing with Blake. Destroy Blake. Depend on it. And then to complain about his not having killed Blake. You're in a lot of trouble, Travis. The character as originally conceived was male. So then you cast Jacqueline Pierce, who would play the character as a thirsty aunt wearing a slinky dress and heels while swanning about in quarries. Servalan would return here and there, mainly in Travis episodes, before taking over the entire Federation at one point. Maximum power! She would eventually be deposed and would come back under a pseudonym. Truth be told, Servalan was a far better main villain for the series. You made it easy because you wanted to believe it. Servalan as president had two goals, to quickly expand the Federation and hence increase her power base, and to capture the Liberator for herself. Servalan also has lots of implied flings along the way. At one point, even trying to tempt Avon into joining her. Handgun? It's a bit elaborate for a toothpick. The crew have their own unique hand weapons. They are advanced, but they still have wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Liberator is unique in that it has a working teleport system based on whoever is wearing one of these stylish teleport bracelets. They have a communicator built in, so crew members can be whisked back to the safety of the ship at a moment's notice. As a result, Liberator never needs to land on a planet. The ship's computer, Zen, can fly the Liberator, but the crew take time to learn how to fly their new vessel themselves. The Liberator has an advanced auto repair system, numerous cabins, Pilates studio, an advanced surgical unit, tea and coffee making facilities, a selection of board games, a vast wardrobe and a vault containing valuable metals and precious gems. It's also armed with powerful neutron blasters and protected by an energy deflecting force wall. The ship can repair itself but will occasionally need to stand still for a while to recharge its energy banks. Now, it's all well and good, but if everything I just outlined worked perfectly, there would be no drama. That one's hot. In most episodes, some of the crew will teleport down somewhere. And then to avoid having the teleport be a metaphorical get out of jail free card, it has to be removed from the equation. The teleport, as with the transporters on Star Trek, is a wonderful device for avoiding having to show the ship landing. But if you can just zap out of danger, where would the drama be? We can't stay here, so you're not going to leave without us. I think they went without us. The teleport was first used by Blake as a literal get out of jail free card when he wanted to retrieve the prisoners on Cygnus Alpha if they wanted to join his crew. But if you had that every week, episodes would be shorter than a Ramones B-side. While the device working perfectly had the potential to rob the show of conflict, instead, unavailability of the teleport would, for whatever reason, be the series' most reliable driver of peril. People would lose their teleport bracelets or have them confiscated after capture. The teleport would malfunction or be put 
deliberately out of action. There would be some energy field that prevented its use. Or, of course, the number one cliche, the ship had to leave all but briefly for some reason, usually to escape a Federation patrol, or the ship was taken over. Or maybe Zen was having a really bad day and needed to clear its head. Liberator, do you read me? So Blake, or whoever on the planet, would have to fend for themselves until later in the episode when the rest of the crew were able to return. This was great because it usually gave the crew left behind something to do, which in turn gave all of the actors something to do. This was the theory. Interceptors are bearing directly on this position. Occasionally, particularly in the second season, the writers wouldn't even bother to do anything with those on the ship, which would contribute to Sally Navette and later Jan Chapel leaving the series. Another favourite way of suddenly injecting some jeopardy into an episode, the ship encounters some unstable part of space which nearly destroys the ship when the crew plough headlong through some anomaly rather than just take a damn detour. Together we can fly the ship manually. I think we make a good team. Well, hooray for us. Just as Blake's efforts to take on the Federation gain traction, Space Commander Travis is assigned to recapture Blake. After Callie is captured, Travis attempts to tempt Blake into a trap. Trick I learned from you, Travis. I got here first. On another occasion, powerful aliens pit Travis and Blake against each other in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Later, Travis sets up another trap to take out the Liberator crew with a deadly virus. And finally, Servalane wants to get her hands on a supercomputer named Orac without paying the bill. And she and Travis try to collect the machine from its dying creator Ensor, but Blake gets in first. Orac is a supercomputer. I mean, it's not super powered, but very powerful, as it's able to pull information from virtually any computer in the Federation. Orac can also operate the teleport by remote control and is magically able to shrink itself for a few hours in order to help Avon and Villa cheat in a casino. I have noticed that the occupants of this spacecraft have a lamentable lack of interest in the more fascinating aspects of the universe. Problem is, Orac is not particularly helpful, and truth be told, despite the anatomical impossibility, is a complete dick. Orac would go on to be played by Zen voice artist Peter Tuddenham, and on occasion the two characters would have to speak to each other, with Tuddenham performing both characters live in the corner of the studio. All energy banks recharged. Excellent. Excellent. Orek is scientifically curious, irascible, prissy, but has no loyalty to anyone other than itself. It would on occasion pull a rabbit out of its hat to save the day. Yes, I know it's a computer, it doesn't literally wear a hat. It cannot get melanoma from too much sun, just discoloured perspex. Later seasons would have to invent ways of making Orak not so powerful, or at least unable to save the day. However, the subject of Orak erotica fanfiction is one that we will definitely not cover in this video. I love you, Orak! When first brought on board the Liberator, the little box of tricks would show off its powers by making a prediction that a space vessel that we took to be the Liberator was destroyed. Bam! End of Series 1. Series A, Season 1 or whatever you want to call it, was a solid series made on a minuscule budget, and this season is probably the one that most suffers visually. It doesn't do a lot that's outlandish or too surprising, but it's almost always solid with only two or three lesser episodes. The web, bounty, breakdown, they do feel like episodes where Terry Nation's imagination was flagging a bit. Spacefall, Cygnus Alpha, Seek Locate Destroy, Duel, Project Avalon, and to a lesser extent, the final two episodes are exciting, mostly well made within the show's constraints, and above all, highly entertaining, even decades later. Cool. I don't want to hear your feeble excuses. Let's look at the origins of Lake 7. Terry Nation was a Welsh writer who started his career writing jokes for comedians and variety shows. At one time in the early 60s, he was writing for comedy star Tony Hancock. But after an argument with the prickly star on tour, the writer suddenly found himself out of work. He reluctantly took on a quick job cranking out seven episodes for a new kids science fiction serial for the BBC. His serial introduced a race of creatures, the Daleks, who of course were killed off at the serial's conclusion while Terry Nation moved on to his next job, secure in the knowledge that he'd never have to think about these bloody dustbins ever again. Good riddance to bad rubbish. Phew, they stank, never more. And scene. However, they were an instant hit that put both Doctor Who and Terry Nation on the map. And here they are on the central line. Terry Nation would write more serials for Doctor Who, most of which would feature the Daleks, now invading Earth or chasing the Doctor in their own time machine staffed by moron Daleks, or perhaps after a typo got out of hand, tried to take over the galaxy with a glass box holding indoor plants. I had to hand the real Terranium core over to Magic Mavic Chen. 
Later on, Nation would allow other scribes to write for his creations in Doctor Who, while he himself tried to launch a Doctor Who-less Dalek series, trying to get it off the ground away from the BBC. Throughout the 60s and early 70s, Nation would also write and sometimes script edit for glossy filmed action series such as The Saint, The Baron, The Avengers, Department S and The Persuaders. He got his first series off the ground in the mid-70s with Survivors, a science fiction series turned dramatization of The Farmer's Almanac, which ran for three seasons. Seasons. After seeing how the BBC's producer of that series took the show in a wildly different direction to that which Nation had originally envisaged, Terry Nation was determined to stay more connected with his next series, whatever that ended up being. The story of how Blake 7 came to be has been told, retold, folded, fluffed up and short-sheeted, but the gist of it is this. In late 1975, Terry Nation pitched some ideas to the BBC, none of which attracted much interest, apart from one idea for a boy's own adventure type series in space. It would be a bit more than two years from that pitch meeting to the first episode premiering in January of 1978. First, Terry Nation wrote a pilot script, which was liked by BBC executives and another script was commissioned, but then there was quite a gap before the series was developed in more detail, followed by a flurry of activity once the series was ordered. In describing Blake 7, Terry Nation would say, depending on when he tells the story and what time of day it was and whose round it was, that the show was The Dirty Dozen in Space or Robin Hood in Space or something in between like Dirty Space Robin, which does sound like a show made by the BBC's Natural History Department that was banned after Mary Whitehouse had a stroke after seeing it listed in the Radio Times. The BBC decided they wanted to make a full series of this new space show, but there was one tiny little detail. It would have to be made with the exact same budget as a stock cop show that it would be replacing, a police series like Softly Softly Task Force, which ended in late 1976. None of us is going to faint with amazement at that, are we? This new show would require special effects, would require costumes, sets, props, created specifically for this new space-bound show. But be made with the same budget and timescale as a contemporary police series. How would you like to make Titanic with the same budget as a repeat of the shipping forecast? Yes, well, I'm always grateful for a rough analogy. Production proper wouldn't begin until 1977, just as a little American film called Star Wars had opened in the US. The film wouldn't open in Britain until a week or so before the BBC premiered its new space-going adventure series, Blake 7. After seeing the film, some of Blake 7's makers were depressed by the inevitable comparisons between Star Wars and their new series. That might just possibly prove something of a problem. While others involved with the series saw it as a challenge. Oh, what a marvellous triumph of the human spirit. We're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. Terry Nation went off to write his 13 scripts, while the BBC offered director David Maloney the job of producing the new show. Maloney had been a top director, helming some of the better episodes of the BBC's other science fiction series about a space vagrant in a blue box, the name of which presently eludes me. Maloney tried to poach that series script editor Robert Holmes, who turned down the offer, but instead suggested a new writer for that other series whose name is on the tip of my tongue like an annoying pimple. Chris Boucher had written three stories for that other series and had wanted to move into writing full-time. He would come on board to fill in the gaps of Terry Nation's scripts, tightening up the dialogue and fleshing out scripts that were coming in very short. Terry Nation had been handing in first drafts that were occasionally barely longer than a recipe for a pound cake with lemon glaze. When pressed, Nation asked Boucher whether he wanted to rewrite or the next script. Boucher chose the latter and filled in the scripts himself. Chris Boucher's influence on the series, even in the first season where Nation was credited with writing each episode, cannot be stressed enough. Counting yourself, that makes two people who think you're wonderful. He would remain script editor for the series' entire run, and in later series would go on to write some of the series' very best scripts. Meanwhile, make sure you heat the oven properly before baking a pound cake. The super vessel Liberator was meant to be the most advanced in the galaxy and so it had to look special both inside and out. Set designer Roger Murray Leach, another Doctor Who alum, Doctor Who, that was it! Anyway, Roger Murray Leach designed both the interior of the ship and somewhat controversially within the BBC effects department, the ship's exterior. Ship like this could go anywhere. 
there's a running design theme of hexagons and hints of a humanoid but perhaps alien civilization. A beautiful design was one thing but at the same time it had to be built to a budget. So some fittings come from lamps and the control desks are molded from a cluster of BBC in trays. Anyway, it still looked the business. However, three years of wear and tear from being transported, erected and dismantled again and again would begin to show. For a newcomer to Blake 7, if you saw a still photo of the Liberator, you could be forgiven for thinking it travels a certain way. But then when you finally saw the ship in motion, your mind may have been blown when you realised it wasn't in fact backing up. you could look at Blake 7 at a surface level and just say it's Aldi brand Star Wars. There's possibly more Star Trek and Space 1999 DNA in the show, as well as a lot from Doctor Who. Everything influences everything else. So take the Starfleet logo of original Star Trek, turn it on its side, add a circle, and you have the Blake 7 Federation logo. Then you turn it up again and you have the Starfleet logo from the 80s movies. Okay, I have been spending way too much time on the internet today. The Liberator exterior features a similar design language to the Enterprise, while Scorpio feels very similar to the Millennium Falcon. Both are the fastest hunks of junks in their respective galaxies. Obsolete but functional. I want it flown, not catalogued. Some of the cast had a reasonable profile before Blake 7. Jacqueline Pierce had appeared in many guest shots over the years. Gareth Thomas had recently appeared in the well-regarded Children of the Stones and the less well-regarded Star Maidens. Paul Darrow, Michael Keating, Brian Croucher and voice artist Peter Tudnam had all done spots on shows like Doctor Who. And he can't win. You know he can't win. What do you want to be? Rich or dead? Each episode of Blake 7 generally took about 10 days to make, including pre-filming on location or in the BBC's Ealing studio. There were several days of rehearsals and then two days in the studio where an episode would have to be recorded in a couple of hours, in theory. In practice, this was not always the case, as it became all too common for episodes not to be completed within their allocated studio session, which meant sessions for the next episode would also have to record whatever had been missed from the previous episode, and so on. To say certain episodes were made in a mad rush would be an understatement. But that's impossible. Logic units concur that it is impossible. But it happened anyway. Logic units concur that it happened. Future series would attempt to tame the production schedules in various ways, but the major change was to split each series into two blocks, with each preceded by a major location shoot where filming for six or seven episodes could be carried out in one hit, and afterwards those episodes would have their studio days with the rest of the season produced in the same way. It would also not be uncommon to record liberator scenes for several episodes in one studio session. I've become interested in sabotage. In a small way, you understand, nothing too ambitious. I hate vulgarity, don't you? The first series of Blake 7 had proved to be successful enough that the BBC quickly pressed forward with a second series. From the very start, the BBC had planned for 26 episodes, with actors, contracts and their options generally reflecting this. Most of the cast returned, though Travis actor Stephen Greif left after he had scheduling conflicts with another role. The second series would see more eccentric designs for sets and costumes, would feature a continuing story arc in many episodes, and would develop some characters while regressing many others. And of course, they were just plain nuke one in particular. There was a bit of a budget bump, but some scheduling headaches remained. Series creator Terry Nation would only provide three scripts for the new season, while script editor Chris Boucher would finally be able to put out scripts under his own name. It's what you've waited for. Series 2 began with the aftermath of Aurak's prediction. The crew tried to prevent any potential destruction, while Avon just assumes Aurak's prediction included accurate location information. The makers of Liberator reclaim the ship and imprison the crew, so we get a very brief look at the computer-based society that builds Liberator. Before, Aurak, of course, does something clever to make sure it's one of Liberator's sister ships that's destroyed. We'll meet Travis Mark II, now played by actor Brian Croucher. Travis is now taller, a little less polished, slightly more cockney, so if I'm guilty of murder, of, of mass murder, then so are all of you! His failure to recapture Blake will see him used as a scapegoat by Serverland to cover her own failings. The rest of the season sees a weird seesawing. One episode has Serverland working with Travis, then their enemies, then they're working together again, then their enemies. It's like the time you had a pleasant drink with your office nemesis Alex Melly, thinking you've put any prior animosity behind you. You believed it, Blake. And then the next week, Smelly is again knocking on you to HR because you had a second cupcake. Travis ends the season ready to betray all of humanity for some reason, just like that backstabbing traitor cupcake narc Alex Smelly. Season 2 has a basic thread. 
Blake wants to ramp up his crusade against the Federation, first trying to involve organised crime and then deciding unilaterally to attack the Federation Central Control Complex on Earth. Blake's increasing fanaticism is worrying, but at the same time, Avon nails his colours to the mast. Somebody has to take charge of all this. The attack on Central is a disaster, with the complex turning out to be a giant empty room. And of course, Gan is killed during their escape. Terry Nation had decided that one of the crew had to die, purely for dramatic reasons. And his thinking was that it should be Villa. That's a bit morbid, isn't it? Villa was a viewer favourite, but some BBC executives had it in their head that Villa was expendable. I'm tired of being indispensable. Other candidates for being written out were Kelly and Gan, but in the end it was Gan who was offered as a blood sacrifice. Nope. Despite David Jackson's solid performance, the show never really had any idea of what to do with him. Even in the one show that was mostly about Gan, he was actually unconscious for most of that episode. I fell on me. He did. Scripts would have Gan either having a fight or having to demonstrate his feats of strength in order for the actor to have something to do. It didn't help when somebody gave Gan an instruction, Gan would respond with a thumbs up. So Gan dies, and everybody pretty soon gets on with their lives. Gan's dead. Blake is consumed with guilt in the following episode while Avon tries to talk his crewmates into abandoning Blake. And then Blake decides to get back on his high horse and attack the Federation. Much of the rest of the season on and off deals with tracking down people who know the real location to control, known as Star One. The season closer finally gets the crew to Star One at the very edge of the galaxy. But things aren't going so well. Star One is having conniptions and just as Blake, Kelly and Avon set explosives to destroy the complex, they stumble upon an alien invasion. Isn't that always the way? I swear that happened to me once. Blake is wounded and Travis finally dealt with. Is Travis dead? He is now. But the alien invasion has begun, with Avon promising to hold off the aliens until help from the Federation arrives. Then the series ends with an incredible anti-climax, the second time this season where somebody's reaching to fire the Liberator main weapons before we crash to the end credits. Fire! Viewers back in the day would have to wait until the following season to see the battle, but as we'll outline in a bit, you really shouldn't expect to see Gareth Thomas and Sally Navette. Both had said they were not returning, but at the same time, neither is explicitly written out. They would be regulars no more, but they would also have no leaving scene, and the following series has the crew more or less forgetting about looking for their former crewmates. The second season has one or two really good episodes, Redemption, Trial, Killer and Star One being very good, but most of the rest of the season is quite ordinary. Weapon, Horizon, Hostage and the especially risible voice from the past are not particularly good, and some episodes by one of the directors in particular have pacing so incredibly languid you'd think the cast had their meals in the BBC canteen spiked with crushed up Valium. With the series now a hit with family audiences, certain aspects of the show were toned down. Violence is a little less overt in the second series. I got this shocking pain right behind the eyes. Have you considered amputation? And of course, mentions of the crimes Blake was accused of in order for the Federation to frame him are conspicuous by their absence. All involving children. Of course, an episode showing Blake's relationship with his apparent first cousin tries very hard to avoid any word that rhymes with schminzest. A space-bound show needed to show the starships in action. At the start of the series, a large proportion of the show's effects budget was used to create a high-quality library of stock shots of the Liberator and of the prison transporter seen in the first few episodes. Some shots of the Liberator were created by animating photographic cutouts. Others were shot at Bray Studios by a camera crew who knew how to properly light and shoot model work. There is some absolutely stunning footage. Later episodes had their own requirements which would require new footage, but the quality can vary markedly. Some of it is fine and some of it looks rather amateurish, like Americans playing rugby for the first time. I don't particularly begrudge the BBC for reusing the better stock footage to the point where it was recognisable, but as we're about to see, there are limits. The third season, or Series C, began with the Intergalactic War, a battle between vessels of our galaxy and the ships of hostile neighbouring galaxy Andromeda. As almost all of this battle, bar a few filmed inserts of the remaining Liberator crew, was cobbled together out of stock footage. Freighters, Starliners and space stations now became warring battleships. 
After that disappointment, the series would now continue, and would concentrate on Avon as the leader of the Liberator. In the first episode, the ship was heavily damaged by the space battle, and the crew briefly abandoned the ship. For whatever reason, Blake and Jenna are not recovered, with occasional updates suggesting they are fine and dandy. Avon, of course, makes a very token effort to search for his former leader, like an Audi driver making a token effort to use the indicator stalk just as they cut you off. The upshot is there is room for a few new crew members. She's very good. Promising. Quite promising. Dana Mellonby was the daughter of a Federation exile who developed high-tech weapons, though young Dana herself likes old-fashioned combat. When you fight with them, conflict becomes more personal, more exciting. More dangerous. Dana is a capable fighter and an expert in weaponry. Josette Simon was still in drama school when producer David Maloney lobbied the Actors' Union to be able to hire her for the role. Now I want you to close your eyes. Close my eyes? We're going to play a little game. Dana spends most episodes this season in a wardrobe that's disco ready, able to strike a pose when she needs to, but also somehow has a worryingly high amount of explosives hidden upon her person. From grenades, exploding fake teeth, and remote bombs. Where the heck did that come from? I mean, this really shouldn't be news. Blake 7 characters were always pulling random explosives and gadgets out of nowhere. Dana has a sort of mission throughout the series. I'm going to kill you sooner or later. The other new character was a dashing buccaneer who was as capable a pilot as Jenna. Del Tarrant is meant to be a grizzled 35-year-old Federation-trained space captain turned smuggler and pirate, and was instead played by 21-year-old Stephen Pacey. For the early part of the season, there's a sort of rivalry between Avon and Tarrant for the leadership role, but after a few episodes, Avon is the undisputed leader of the group. One day, Avon, I may have to kill you. It has been tried. Tarrant is prone to blundering into a situation with less subtlety than Blake, and it's hard not to notice that the character that replaced Blake seemed to point to the same picture at the barber. Hello, Baben. I heard a rumor you were dead. Funny, that turns out to be true. Do I know you? That's the trouble with celebrities. They never remember the little... Where is Villa? The original plan for the year was to have two story arcs. One was a search for Blake, which was not popular with the series' new star. And the other arc would involve a character known as the Captain, or Tarrant, who would eventually be revealed as a Federation spy. Scripting issues meant that that was nixed, and Tarrant just became another one of the crew. Unfortunately, there was no replacement arc, and so the 1980 series does meander along with nothing of any consequence bubbling away in the background. Servalan wants to capture or destroy the Liberator in a few episodes, but all talk of destroying the Federation has gone out of the window. The Federation is greatly contracted in the wake of the Intergalactic War. In one episode, the Liberator is looking for recruits and a base, and then after that they just ignore the Federation while they go off doing whatever. Meanwhile, Servalan's Federation is regrouping and expanding. The lack of motivation of the Liberator crew this series is perhaps best exemplified by one episode where a coup has taken place on Earth. Avon and company blunder in and seem to help the Federation restored the status quo. Servalan can hand over power. Dead, she's just one more corpse. Haven't we got enough of those? We're clearing them away now. It's not what I meant. The third series saw more episodes highlighting an individual character. We go to Callie's homeworld, Aron, where we meet her twin sister. We meet Avon's supposedly dead girlfriend, Anna Grant. Anna's alive, and Avon's not actually pleased about this fact, because he's just realised the florist will not refund the funeral wreath he sent without charging a bullshit restocking fee. Callie is taken over by an alien again, giving Jan Chapel her best episode of the entire series, and Villa gets himself some. Of course, Series 3 is Avon's Year of the Snog. If Season 3 or Series C does have an unofficial theme, it's of family ties, because over the course of this year, we'll see Dana's father murdered, Callie's sister killed, Taryn's brother dead, Servalan's offspring destroyed, and the love of Avon's life turning out to have been a spy all along. I was only ever Anna Grant with you. It's also childish to criticise special effects that didn't pan out. Effects produced with the series' low budget and short time frames. To point and stare at some dodgy model work, makeup effects that seem a bit silly, costumes that were a bit on the arch side, fight scenes cobbled together in the last five minutes of a studio recording, Moloch. Yes, that is how I reasoned you would look. Dodgy chroma key, reuse of monsters from Doctor Who, etc. It's all really, really immature to point out effects like this and this, and this, or this, 
or this. I mean, it's really childish, like this. So we won't do that. The entire series was to have ended with this season's last episode, Terminal, which saw the crew marooned on a hostile planet while Servalan had taken control of the Liberator. Unfortunately for her, she did not get a mechanics inspection done first and the ship was destroyed, along with Zen. I have failed you. So that was it. It was all done and dusted. As the cast and crew sat at home watching the intended series finale, a voiceover dropped a bombshell over the end credits that Blake Seven would return. Apparently the head of the BBC was at home watching the episode and liked it so much that he called into work to tell him to announce another series. Willingly renewing a science fiction series is not something the BBC would do five or six years later. The third season does have its ups and downs. The crew seem to be dressed either as doormen or pirates. The Liberator, the most powerful ship in the galaxy, has turned into a party bus with its crew hosting cocktail parties and board game night. There's no driving theme for the most part and the crew's motivations for doing anything seems to be either greed or boredom. The show really could have done with a more explicit explanation for Blake and Jenna's whereabouts and Avon is meant to be the main character but he's less the undisputed leader of the group, more the guy who just pulls their butts out of the fire more and more often. Some folks really love the third series and it has some very good episodes opening and closing the series with some absolute crackers in the middle. It just feels a little disjointed now that they weren't working towards anything. It must have been so dull, having no one to argue with. With a sudden renewal came a mad dash to actually get it made. Producer David Maloney had already moved on to new projects. Director Via Lorimer had helmed more episodes than anybody else and he was offered the job of producing the fourth series. Script editor Chris Boucher would return, but as Terry Nation had by this stage moved to the US, it would be up to Boucher and Lorimer to reformat the series. They'd need a new ship for one thing and a new computer. And also Jan Chappell had said she was done and so they'd need a new character. Even so, this fourth year was again planned to be the last hurrah. Callie is dead. The crew are rescued from Terminal by a weirdo called Dorian who has an ancient spaceship, an advanced shipboard computer called Slave and a tricked out base where his gunfighter girlfriend Sulin is waiting. Dorian also turns out to be, well I suppose, a serial killer of sorts. By the end of this series second episode, the crew now have a base on the planet Xenon, the new ship, the freighter Scorpio, a new computer in the form of the obsequious Slave and a working teleport system. And of course, a new member of the crew. You give your allegiance easily. I don't give my allegiance at all. I sell my skill. Sulin is a top gunfighter, having learned from the man who killed her parents, who she then killed. I have a similar history. You just have to swap out gunfighter with piano teacher, but you get the idea. I could explain it, I suppose. The only character who doesn't get an episode where they're prominently featured was Sulin, though she does play a larger role in many of the episodes in the latter half of the season. Glynis Barber found settling into the role a little difficult early on, though she would soon find a rhythm to her dialogue, unknowingly flip sarcasm that gave her lines a bit more bite than had been given to a character like Kelly. You should be a professional. I am. I know. Scorpio's new computer slave has its own meek personality, obsequious and fawning like a real estate agent in a really lousy market. Further damage is under assessment. A mess in fact. Yes. Oh, sorry sir. Like Aurak and Zen, Slave would also be voiced by Peter Tuddenham. Unlike last year, this series would have something to work towards. Firstly, Avon and company need to do something about their new ship. It's old old enough to remember when a fax machine was described as new and fangled. And then upon finding out that the Federation's empire is expanding again at an incredibly fast rate, they kick into action to start gathering allies. Of course, this being Blake 7, pretty much every one of those allies of the Liberator crew, I mean the Scorpio crew, will end up dead by the end of that episode. Scientist who gives them an antidote, fried. Engineer who installs a faster star drive in Scorpio, toast. Scientist helping them, blammo. Another scientist lost his head, and so on. But I think I'm gonna have to keep a jar where I have to add coins every time I accidentally call them the Liberator crew. We had a ship called the Liberator. It was destroyed fairly recently. Servalan had been deposed as president between seasons, but here she returns under the pseudonym Commissioner Slear. Servalan's plan is to reclaim her position of power, but along the way crosses swords with the crew of the Liberator. Ah, damn it! I mean Scorpio. 
Just how are the Federation expanding again so quickly? A new drug pacification program led by SLEA. How many people have you killed to conceal your secret? Servalan also has to work very hard to keep her secret, since she keeps running into people who recognize her. 26. So far. The crew have fewer changes of clothes this season. They start out with their outfits from the end of the last season before getting their winter outfits, which look cozy before midway through the season, everyone gets a summer wardrobe that will see them through to the end of the series. Apart from Avon, who decides in the last few episodes that he really liked the winter look better. Few changes of clothes meant fewer arguments over whose turn it was to do the washing. Also from a production continuity standpoint, each block of location filming was a little bit easier to manage. The Liberator crew, damn. The Scorpio crew now have explosive handguns, which have multiple ammunition types available through the use of clips, where you can tell if they're about to be used with these black tubes containing the explosive charge. Some of the time they've actually neglected to put the magazines in, or if they have, they're backwards. Contrast this to the light up Liberator sidearms that seem to go off by accident all the time. Jenna. Later episodes of the fourth series would see the crew ending an episode losing the day more and more. New allies, dead. Get rich quick schemes, dead. Sulin's implied partner Dorian is dispatched early on. Dana has a romance with a former tutor, which if you do the maths is creepier than swamp leeches partying on your back. Villa flirts with a computer this year. Avon kisses Pella just as he steals her crystals, but this year's snog master among the main crew is Tarrant. He's the only one to get anywhere. He beds first Servalan and later his new girlfriend, Ziona, the daughter of a warlord supposedly joining Avon's coalition of anti-Federation forces. Daddy Zukan turns out to be in league with Servalan, and Xenon base is almost destroyed. With their secret base now as secret as the Konami cheat code, the crew abandons Xenon base. All explosive devices have functioned correctly, monster. Avon has one more trick up his sleeve, another rebel leader who can unite the rebel. You think you found Blake? I would have left Blake where he was and said nothing, if things had gone according to plan. On the lawless Gowda Prime, which turns out conveniently to be Sulin's homeworld, a bounty hunter who looks suspiciously familiar is testing would-be recruits. On approaching the planet Gowda Prime, Scorpio is attacked and the crew abandon ship, apart from Tarrant, who has to crash land the ship. Slave is doomed but our bounty hunter friend collects a heavily injured Tarrant. Blake is playing games by testing recruits for his new rebel army, except Tarrant hasn't got the memo. By this stage, with so many misunderstandings, Avon and Blake's reunion, well, things don't go so well. And then the Federation troops swarm in, killing the crew one by one. Well, in echoey slow motion, so maybe they survived. And then Avon, having lost his companions, surrounded by the Federation, does what he does in these situations. The end. Does Avon survive? Well, look, anything's possible, especially if you ignore the gunfire sound effects played over the end credits. And with that, a few days before Christmas of 1981, Blake Seven was done and dusted. Orak and Servalan are the only major characters whose fates are left unclear, and possibly Jenna. Blake says she was killed, but we're not sure if this was a way to provoke a reaction from Tarrant. Some fans hated the fourth season, some love it. I'm in the latter category since that's where I joined the show. Season 4's production values have picked up considerably from the previous years. It still has effects that don't always quite come off, and more than a few dodgy scripts. I am not a space rat. But it was really fun action adventure. Season 4 is unabashedly a series from the 1980s, with over-the-top makeup effects and a not particularly subtle dig at punk. The sudden renewal meant a mad scramble to get scripts, and as such, the first half of the season can modulate between good, solid episodes and really quite bad episodes. Episodes so hysterically bad you feel like slapping them to bring them to their senses. Oh, it hurts. Yes, we're talking about episodes like Star Drive, Assassin, and especially Animals. Then the latter half of the year, once everything was up to speed, has gems like Games, Sand, Orbit, and of course, Blake, the best episode of the season. It's a pity they ended the show when they did. Decades later, this is one show ending that bums me out more than any other. But what a way to go out. Thieves, killers, mercenaries, psychopaths. Scorpio as a design does have similarities with some early design sketches that the visual effects department had created for the Liberator. The interior sets were designed with production realities in mind. The bridge set was intended to be more robust, though it does make the ship interior look like the inside of a milking shed. 
Since the crew now had Zen on base, Scorpio was usually just one main bridge set with a teleport nook off to the side. I once tried to convert a study nook into a teleport nook, but just ended up with a makeshift skylight. This does sound cool and all, but not when you live in the downstairs flat. The model work in this fourth series has taken a major step up in quality. One refinement was to film moving Scorpio shots against blue and electronically combine it with a different background. One thing of note, BBC Visual Effects Department employee Ron Thornton, who worked on the Scorpio exterior models, would later provide the CG effects for the early years of Babylon 5. Lake 7 has a rousing theme tune composed by Dudley Simpson, who'd been Doctor Who's main composer for most of the 70s. Simpson would also compose most of the background music for the series, including what seems like dozens of variations of teleport music. The BBC Radiophonic Workshop also created a library of unique sound effects created by workshop staff Richard Yeoman Clark and later Elizabeth Parker. You have one other quality I admire very much. Yes. There was a reasonable amount of merchandise available for the show while it was in production. A few novelizations, a few toys, including the much loved die cast metal liberator by Corgi. There was an official Blake 7 magazine running for two years, an official follow up novel Afterlife, an unofficial Avon focused prequel written by Paul Darrow, videos combining several episodes edited into movies, and then a full episodic release in the 90s. Of course, then there were novels and audio plays from various vendors before ending up at Big Finish. There were soundtrack releases, there were sound effects releases, there were model kits and toys, both official and shh, you ain't seen nothing, right? There was even the early 2000s short film, Blake's Junction 7. How fascinating. You can see echoes of Blake 7 in shows like Babylon 5, Firefly, Farscape, etc. And Star Wars Andor feels a lot like Blake 7, but with a budget that buys more than a family meal deal at KFC. Back on Earth, they used to say it was the most excitement you can have with your clothes on anywhere in the galaxy. As for the best and worst of the series, we'll start with the duds, which is not a reference to Dudley Simpson, whose work providing over 100 variations of teleport arrive music tied the series together. <laughs> now, we mean the lesser episodes, things like Bounty, Weapon, Horizon, Hostage, Voice from the Past, Volcano, Harvest of Kairos, Moloch, Star Drive, Animals and Assassin. And I would have to go with Animals as the absolute very worst, mainly because it gets so very little right. But as for the best of the best, we have Cygnus Alpha, Seek, Locate, Destroy, Duel, Redemption, Trial, Killer, Star One, City at the Edge of the World, Rumors of Death, Sarcophagus. And then in the final run, Games, Sand, Orbit, and of course, Blake. Indulge me. Blake 7 fans will have their own favorites and not so favorites. Like how any box of chocolates always has those awful coffee toffee banoffee ones that nobody likes that you can only get rid of by feeding to guests who show up unannounced. <laughs> <laughs> Blake Seven's cast would have various fortunes after the series. Some worked more visibly on television than others, all worked on stage and in various guest roles. Jacqueline Pierce had an especially rough time due to struggles with her mental health, though she would continue to work here and there. The two actors with the highest profile jobs would probably be Glynis Barber, who would star in the mid-80s cop show Dempsey and Makepeace, and later appear in many British soaps and Josette Simon, who would become a well-respected serious actor. Holy shit, she even popped up recently in The Witcher, and she doesn't look all that different. Stephen Pacey appeared in dozens of productions, according to his listing on IMDb, but by a quirk of fate, nothing that I've ever watched. But he is the voice of the Rat King in Dark Souls 2. And of course, Paul Darrow appeared in Little Britain. Yeah. <laughs> Series creator Terry Nation moved to America, where he worked on various things, but most notably, he'd worked on early episodes of MacGyver. The show's first producer, David Maloney, would produce an acclaimed adaptation of Day of the Triffids. Script editor and writer Chris Boucher wrote for various shows on British television, but a few years after the end of Blake 7, had managed to sell his own show, the space-set near-future detective series Star Cops, a show that feels like Blake 7 in more than a few ways, just with slightly higher production values. Your skin always did come first, didn't it? 
would you reproach me for that? Blake Seven is a show that has a finite ending to its story. It's not a happy ending, it's a powerful ending. Good doesn't always triumph. I mean, it could have just been easy to end the show with a voiceover that says, and the Federation was eventually defeated by, oh, let's just say, Jacko. The BBC did not take the easy way out to end this series. <laughs> Villa went on to play several sold-out seasons at Space City. Tarrant bought a yacht. Sulin hosts the top-rated cooking show Guns and Goulash. Dana became a celebrated portrait artist. Avon opened a B&B, but what we had was this. Villa died. Tarrant died. Dana died. Sulin died. Avon shot first, and then he died. And that is Blake Seven. That's what I thought. It's a show that I'm just a little bit more into than many of the shows that we cover on this channel. It's one of my top favourite shows of all time, and no, I'm not telling you what the others are. We will probably return to Blake Seven one day to take a look at each of the 52 episodes. It beats work. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos. It's just that a universe without Avon and Tarrant will take a certain amount of getting used to.